Mr. Sperry. I'm happy to greet you in Baku. Welcome to our city and thank you so much for accepting our invitation to be interviewed. Uh, Mr. Hashimov, it is an honor to be at this table with you tonight. It is a great, great pleasure to be in Baku for several days and it is a excellent timing that I'm here because you have a celebration, uh, a one-year celebration that I'm here by coincidence. When people reach a certain age, they mostly reminisce their childhood. Think back about your childhood, please. Where were you born? I was born in the south of Germany at the beginning of the Danube River. And I stayed there until my 11th years of age. Who were your parents? I'm born to German parents. My father, Werner, who is uh, from Stuttgart. He is a language expert. He speaks nine languages. He was posted to three different countries in his foreign service career for Germany. And my mother is a um, working in a hospital. Asking, because still thinking about your name, Kolya. Nikolai called Kolya usually in Russian-speaking environment. So, I wonder, why Kolya? I'm born in the west of Germany in 1969. The name Kolya was extremely rare. Only maybe three Kolyas in all of West Germany. In East Germany, it was a more popular name, of course, because of the Russian presence in East Germany. Uh, it is quite funny for me today, uh, when I travel to Russia, Russians have a problem to call me Kolya because it is a diminutive, it is so personal. They always call me Nikolai. Think please about your first toy that you still remember. That is a difficult question. What I remember is that whatever I got, uh, like a, a bobby car or a, a little bicycle, I usually uh, <laughs> destroyed it uh, very quickly because I was uh, trying to be uh, too fast with everything. This is characteristic for all the children. They usually turn it over and curiously look at the backside right after the toy is presented. Say they watch TV and get deeply interested how the human got into. They put efforts trying to look at the backside of the TV set. It is their inherent quality. Yes, yes. In my case, um, I think I had a tendency very early to move, to move fast. And uh, this was uh, an urge to make me travel. And I always liked speed because my main business for many, many years was sport, especially Formula One. Really, all the kids always have some fantastic ideas and thoughts. Maybe they see the events going around even better than us. As you have just said, you were always in a hurry, and that is why I decided to become a traveler. Uh, yes, and uh, through my parents, it was also uh, put into my bed early on, because my parents love to travel and because of their work in the Foreign Service. At age 11, I moved to Istanbul and then a whole new world opened for me. You have traveled to about 200 countries in the world. That's correct. I was in every country in the world and it's not so easy to define how many countries there are. So I was in 193 United Nations member countries. Uh, there is more countries that are completely autonomous, that makes it 206 countries in the world. But in this calculation, we don't even have Scotland or Wales because they are part of United Kingdom. So it is a difficult calculation. The easiest way to say I have been 
to every country its 193 United Nations members. The, uh, and haven't you ever calculated how many days or years did you spend on these travels? I calculated at least five days per trip and it makes over 1,000 days. Have you ever tried? Uh, I never made the calculation uh, because I think it would be uh, crazy to spend so much time on travel. It is a hobby that is an addiction also. I spend a lot of time traveling. The most interesting is that you travel through various roads, like seas, mountains, deserts, cities, islands, meeting different animals, trees. Around more than 200 countries means already a world. Do you have any resume about the world? Is it the same world that you imagined being a child? In the beginning, uh, I like to have uh, pleasure when I travel. For example, I want to go to nice beaches for windsurfing and I want to see uh, beautiful women in uh, exotic countries, uh, maybe normal holidays. But then the travel life changes. Uh, I became a systematic traveler. At one point I realized I want to go to every country. So you start ticking off the boxes. Some countries only a short time, other countries a longer time. And in my case, what is a bit special about me, I'm very much interested in geopolitics and I started to develop an interest in conflict countries, in war countries. I have been to every contemporary conflict area in the world. I know that you are here already several days, being one of our dearest guests. As you know, Azerbaijan has recently solved the conflict that had been involved in and celebrating the first anniversary of the victory these days. You visited the lands destroyed by the enemy, including Karabakh. You are also right back from Guba and watched their historical deeds in that city. So, what kind of impressions have you got these days? My first visit to Azerbaijan was in 2007. And it has changed a lot since then. In Baku, uh, you can see a wonderful development, such a beautiful city, uh, fantastic buildings. We are in the Flame Towers uh, Hotel. Uh, this stands iconically for this country. Super beautiful, the development of Baku. Now, I have had the honor because of my close friend, Mehraj Mahmudov, who is the most traveled man of Azerbaijan, that he opened the doors for me to go deeper into the country. I had the unique privilege to be on the first flight to Fuzuli Airport, even before the real opening of the airport. What an experience. From there, we went to Agdam and uh, had um, a visit to the liberated uh, territory. And uh, I have seen every conflict zone. I have been in active war zones. And it was a day with mixed emotions. Every war zone, is showing a scar or inhumanity. And this is a very deep scar. For 30 years, you have had this conflict. And I uh, was shocked by the amount of destruction in the liberated territories. However, I can already see that there is huge efforts being put in the redevelopment, for example, I was shown a plan that Agdam will be rebuilt as an intelligent city, as a smart city for the future. I wish from my heart that uh, the conflict is over and that liberation means the liberation of good forces for your territory and peace for the whole region and all the people on both sides. <laughs> As I have just mentioned and the viewers noticed, you traveled to all the world. Can you now see the difference between Azerbaijan in 2007 
when you came here first time because too much was done in the capital and the provinces. At the same time, what is the difference between Azerbaijan and the other locations in the world, let it be people or some features, like language or culture? You have more spiritual rights to say, because traveled all around the world and can compare. Baku has become a world city since I was here last time. The skyscrapers, the buildings that have been uh, built, the whole cityscape is ultra-modern. It can compete with any landscape, uh, with any uh, big city uh, around the world. I am fascinated uh, by Baku because you also have the seaside, the Caspian Sea is so beautiful, so not many people have uh, the combination of both a modern metropolis and the seaside. In addition, I want to add that uh, you are not an artificial, sterile city like some others in this world that have been built from zero to big in 10, 15 years. In Baku, you have managed to preserve the, the tradition of old buildings, which are very typical for, I think, the end of the 19th century. This gives Baku a special flair not like other new booming cities around the world, you have a good combination or bridge between uh, the history of old Baku and modern Baku. Thanks for your thoughts about our capital, I appreciate You have also visited the liberated Ardam and other cities, fully destroyed, even erased. What impressed you most? Something that you will remember forever. The amount of destruction. I have been to war zones that had big destruction, like I was in Aleppo uh, two years ago. But I have never seen a city or a former city that is completely erased. There is not one building standing in Agdam. It is all destroyed. I think it has been destroyed many years ago. And since 28 years uh, has been neglected. And um, this is for me uh, a new experience. People travel through various means. Sometimes kids wish to fly on board. There are also ships, cars, some travel on bike, some on cart, say chase, or just walking. What do you prefer? Which of them is the most comfortable for you, enjoying, impressive? The true traveler must travel on the ground. Uh, if people fly, they never see uh, really what's happening. My favorite mode is to go by car, in a uh, 4 by 4 car. Uh, and I love to cover uh, long distances because I can see the change of geography, climate, population, building styles. And for me, driving thousands of kilometers is like meditation. For example, I have crossed the whole continent of Europe from Lisbon to not only Vladivostok, but even further to Magadan. And not even uh, only Magadan, I went to Anabar Bay, which is the northernmost end of any street in the world. It's higher than the North Cup. It is uh, a trip where I was with my group, the first foreigner ever to drive such high in, in the north. 72 degrees north. So this is the kind of experience that I seek. I'm in touch with nature, I'm in touch with uh, people on the ground, and I'm completely independent. I don't have to adapt to a bus schedule or a train schedule or even worse, a flight schedule. I have even read that you had experienced minus 62 degrees Celsius. The coldest weather we have during some every 30 years is minus 15, 20. 
Speaking frankly, I don't even imagine minus 62. What does it mean? How would you explain it to us, thousand people? I love the cold. The cold cleans the mind. When you drive for hours and hours and days and days in the cold, you become uh, a, in a meditative state. And I very much enjoyed my trip uh, through all of Siberia by car. We had for three days and three nights, we did not stop, we had minus 50 degrees or colder. It's like on planet Mars. And the record we had in 2014 on this trip, it was the coldest winter in Russia for a long time. We had the minus 62 degrees. When I was getting petrol at a station in Tom Tor, near the Pole of Cold, Oymyakon is the coldest place in the world. And after midnight, it was hard to find somebody. I knocked at the door and it was a beautiful blonde Russian woman opening and she was running the gas station. And when you fill gas in this cold, there's no pump working. You have to rotate the pump in order to get the gas in the car. A real adventure experience. You're freezing like this, get the uh, oil in the car. And then we asked her because it was so unnaturally this feeling, how cold is it really, please? So she went around the house and there was a thermometer, minus 62. And she also said it is, even for them, extremely cold. She was not <coughs> surprised. I was surprised that there's a girl in the middle of Siberia, 500 kilometers around, there's nobody else. And uh, she was running the petrol station. And after midnight, she sold gas to us. But in this area, you cannot fill gas with a normal pump automatically. You have to rotate a pump by hand so the car gets filled up. Otherwise, it's too cold for the, the pump. But what am I telling you about filling gas? I, you are from the country where petrol originates. And I had the pleasure to be on Nefte Dajla Ada, the oil rock island, where I learned a lot of things about uh, the oil industry in much nicer temperatures, at least. You travel so much, you have reached a certain experienced age, live long, as we used to say, and you have already passed 50 of it. Don't know why, but I believe that there must be an event that deeply affected your life, views and principles in general. Could you reminisce or talk about that? At age uh, almost 52 now, I feel that I have seen the world and I understand a lot of what's going on in the world. I have fulfilled my big travel dreams. I was at the North Pole, I was in Antarctica, I have been to every country, I have seen the beauty of the world and I have seen the ugly face of the world. And actually, I have had war zone visits that um, were hard for me to digest. And this is why I'm probably at the end of my travel career. The emotions are, um, you cannot forever uh, consume. If you think about these things, you have to take a rest. Now, I enjoy being at home with my beloved wife since 25 years. I have no children, but I have a wonderful dog and I have a good life at home. So I am able to make a resume under my travel life. But nevertheless, I treasure trips like here to a beautiful country where I have a very special insight. Mr. Spöri, we read, and during the latest four or five decades, cinema and TV are developing. Nowadays, anyone can see any part of the world just in a single click. There is certainly a difference between reading about or watching them from the space and direct visit. Which of them is more correct, more true? Tell me, please. 
One of my main motivations for travel is to understand the truth on the ground. You can only understand the full picture if you are personally there. Now, of course, not everybody is able to travel as much as I do. It's a privilege in my life, which I have worked hard for. But let's take Azerbaijan, for example. If you look at the Western media, what they are saying about the conflict that you've had here, they give a picture which is not accurate. The West is creating a uh, impression that in this war um, there's a uh, Armenian side uh, more doing the right thing and Azerbaijan nobody really knows, nobody speaks about Azerbaijan. So uh, in order not to fall victim of propaganda you have to see yourself on the ground. And um, because uh, Armenia is a, is a Christian country and they have a big lobby, diaspora in um, uh, France and in United States, but even in Germany, uh, they portray this conflict one-sided. Only by coming to Azerbaijan, you get a feeling of what this war really means for the people of Azerbaijan and the history of Karabakh, which is so closely attached to Azerbaijan. And this is uh, also why I am I'm here. I want to, to get the full picture. The media can never do this. You have to see with your own eyes. It is very typical for Western media to reverse victim and perpetrator in many conflicts. Uh, not only here, because it is very clear here, Armenia is breaking international law. But the media is not transporting that message in the West. You can also look in other countries, for example, the Donbas conflict. I was this year in a trench, active trench in Donetsk. I was in Syria, where you have the same problem that the Western media is taking a position that is totally biased and reversing the truth. This is why I travel. I want to understand on the ground, talk with people and see what is really going on, not uh, the biased media. I had um, seen on BBC an interview of your president where he is uh, criticized by the BBC reporter about uh, freedom of press. And I was impressed how he countered, uh, what about Mr. Assange? This is very important. People in the West usually don't know uh, how they themselves are controlled uh, in the messages. And um, I am a traveler who tries to bring home to my friends, to my circle around me, more of the truth that they cannot see in our media. And uh, this is a mission that I have been on uh, maybe for the last years um, because I think it is important that travel unites people, travel can heal people by bringing people together and I think I was successful in opening the eyes of people in Germany that we should not believe that when our television makes um, enemy propaganda. It's particularly strong in Germany in relationship with Russia. We are incited against Russia, especially around the Donbas conflict. And it is a bit true also for the German-Turkish relationship, because relationship between those countries uh, are good between the people, but the media are trying to incite us, because uh, we have many Turkish people in Germany, uh, the president of Turkey is not uh, portrayed positively in our media and um, this is where I try to build bridges. Especially with my background in Istanbul, I'm always interested in having good relations between Germans and Turkish or Turkic people from Istanbul to Almaty. You said that your main language is German. Tell me, please, in just a couple of words, what does it mean, being a German, to be a German? First of all, I'm happy that you agree there's differences between the peoples. These are beautiful differences. Nowadays, everybody wants to mix us to be all the same. I think the Germans have a special quality. They deliver. They have a talent to finish complex problems, like building complex machines, complex logistics. This is uh, why they are world leader. 
in technical area, about 75% of the brands are German brands. I'm a little bit proud of that. The um, downside of German sometimes is because they think so technical, they do not see when they are manipulated by others. Uh, a motor for a German is several pieces put together. Sometimes the German has to understand that there's forces working on this motor which he cannot so easily calculate, but they are very, very important on a world scale. We can see these brands in the streets of Baku or other places in the world at the same time, here in Baku, in our musical academy, Bach's, Beethoven's, Heine's heritage is studied and taught, Goethe's, Hermann Hesse's works are translated into Azerbaijani, German language is widely studied, together with English in our schools. I don't want to dive deep into the German history, there are different pages there, like in other nations' history. This is historian's job and people know about it, especially people who lived those years. You were born in Germany, lived here during the next 11 years, then moved to Turkey. On the other hand, I have read in your biography that you are thinking about deeper analysis and points of contact within German-Russian-Turkish triangle. Could you spell an expression, proverb, phrase, aphorism or just a saying in all these three languages? Ben hemen size cevap veriyorum. Biraz Türkçe konuşuyorum halen. Ufakken sokakta öğrendim İstanbul'da. Ama bir interview için yetmez maalesef. Maalesef Rusça iyi öğrenmedim, hiç öğrenmedim. Her zaman diyorum Rus ne panemayım pa Ruski. This is all I can say. <laughs> First of all, I want to thank you for uh, uh, treasuring the German culture. You know more about German culture than Germans do nowadays, because we don't live anymore in the world where we enjoy uh, the musicians like Bach or the uh, literature of Hermann Hesse, which you uh, know so well. I know from your biography you have translated Hermann Hesse. Uh, we are losing our own culture a little bit at home. And um, it is true that uh, in my life I have now come to a triangle, let's say, of German, Russian, Turkish relations. It was not always like that because when you grow up as a young German, you watch television, you watch Hollywood movies, you are programmed for a pro-American worldview. So for me the dream was to go to Hawaii, which I did, to uh, California, and uh, it was beautiful. I also studied one term in UCLA. Uh, so I was a fan of the United States when I was young. But then over time you develop more understanding of the world, and uh, then uh, I think wisdom teaches you to look more to the other parts of the world. Uh, that's why I'm now here, at the crossroads of uh, Turkish culture, Russian culture, and um, I know that even uh, some Germans made it uh, here and uh, lived here uh, in some areas of, of uh, this country. I am a bit proud that I have managed to get out of the mainstream in Germany or in the Western world and to have a much deeper connection to other cultures. We have a Lateran church here, Kircha. You can meet German heritage in Shamkir and Gögöl regions, former Kanlar. Also in Baku, the old buildings reflect this heritage. Mr. Spöri, we have a proverb here, not the one that reads more, but that who travels knows more. How correct this expression is? What do you think? This is a very important um, point. Uh, 
both sides are true and not true. Some people understand the world and they have never traveled. Some people have traveled all the world, they understand nothing. A strange phenomenon. Uh, it depends uh, really on uh, how your soul sees the world. And um, I have here my club of the most traveled people uh, in the world. We are 25 people in Azerbaijan. And you would be surprised about the number of those travelers who have been to every country, many places in the world. And when they go there, they still see the world through their eyes that they were programmed on television back home. This is a, a thing that I'm still surprised about. After traveling to so many countries, don't you have an idea about staying in some of those cities or countries? Where could it be? First of all, I want to thank you for sharing your time with me here. Um, I know that you are a well-known personality in this country, but I can assure you, you are what we call in German a Weltmann. You're a man of the world and people will feel this when you enter a room here or anywhere else on the planet, you have this presence, this charisma, uh, which I made it a joy to talk to you today. Uh, now, uh, answering your question, uh, over my lifetime, the idea where I want to live has changed. And I have lived in many places. I have lived in Istanbul, a bit in Madrid, uh, in Kazakhstan with my parents. Uh, I was in Martinique, uh, Caribbean for half a year. I lived in Malaysia for half a year, in New Zealand for half a year, now I live in Monaco. Uh, the important thing is uh, you are home where your most uh, precious um, uh, human beings are. And it's, it's a big privilege in life if, if you, uh, as a person, are able to love somebody and uh, are also being loved. And when you find this, you're at home in this place. That could be anywhere. In my case, it is uh, my uh, German wife, where I feel at home. You travel so often and leave your home for days. After how many days do you start missing home? Uh, you ask um, a very important question and I uh, want to share a secret for uh, the happy traveler. The timing is very important. When you travel for a very long period of time and you come back home, you fall in a travel blues. You need days and maybe weeks to recover. The trick is you make fast trips, weekend trips, one week trips, maximum two week trips, then your, your life is more in balance. Uh, don't, uh, I've traveled half a year in my maximum times as a student, it's too long. For example, if you are uh, in the center of, of Europe, let's pick any city, Paris, uh, Berlin, Prague, you can visit 80 countries over the weekend. So this is an opportunity to have. Here in Baku, there's many, many countries in the area. Maybe some are not as open as uh, others, but it is an opportunity to travel uh, just over the weekend. And um, then you see so much uh, of, of the world without having to invest that much uh, time and that much money also. Is there a place, location you wish to go and see after 193 countries? I have only one remaining travel dream. Crossing Antarctica by car. Big Antarctica expedition uh, uh, in the future. I'm deeply grateful, Mr. Spöri, both for coming to Azerbaijan, especially in these significant days, visiting our regions, and my personal thanks for leaving our country with correct impressions. As you have mentioned, sometimes the Western media does not reflect the correct information. That is why, thanks for your impartiality and wish you reach your dream regarding the cross-Antarctic car trip. Thanks again. Thank you, Mr. Hashimov. It's been a huge pleasure to meet you and to talk to you uh, while we are in Azerbaijan, uh, in beautiful Baku. And um, I want to wish the best of luck for your uh, peace process in the region.